Okay, one of the biggest skills that you need in AP government is the ability to analyze quantitative data. Now, quantitative data just means numbers, okay? And there's a lot of numbers in politics, especially when you're talking about polls and, you know, money, Congress spending. So this is an example here. I want to go through one with you, and then you're going to have an example, uh, a chance to actually try it out um, in order to practice a skill, and I'll give you some feedback for that. All right, so first off, we have uh, some very relevant data right now, Virginia Department of Health COVID-19 data. This is of 9-4, and the first data here is cases by age group. So always look at your title first, then look at what the data is showing you. So you got age groups going across the bottom, and then the number of cases that where people have tested positive – um, for COVID. Of course, there could be a lot more people. Matter of fact, there are likely a lot more people who've test, who actually have had COVID, but we don't know because they didn't get tested and they had very mild or asymptomatic. They just like didn't have any symptoms. So they never got tested. So these are just the people that tested positive and it's been reported to the state. So um, you just kind of get an idea of, of, of what you're looking at here. If you want to pause and look at it, that's great. I'm going to move on. Then what will happen is you're going to get four questions with quantitative data um, when you're writing an essay. So the first one says, identify the age group with the highest number of cases of COVID in Virginia. Now, notice it's a really straightforward question. In order to answer it, you have to write complete sentences. So you just look at your chart, double check that you got the right one, and you go, oh, wait a second. The age group with the highest number of COVID-19 uh, cases in Virginia is 20 to 29 year olds with 24,943 cases, three cases. That's an appropriate way of answering a question um, in AP. You always have to write um, full sentences and then use data from the chart. Always quote your data. That way also you don't make a mistake. By the way, using the, uh, in order to word your question, I mean, your answer, using a little bit of the wording from the, the question stem is a really great idea. So it asks about age group with the highest number of cases. So I start with the age group with the highest number of COVID cases. So that, that's a good way of doing it. All right, second question. All right, so you got like an identify question that's really straightforward. This is also a common question in quantitative data. Identify a trend in the data rel related to cases by age group. So this, th this could have multiple answers. Let me show you one answer. If you want to pause and kind of look at it, that's fine. But let me let me give you what my answer is. Um, one trend in the data. Notice I use uh, the beginning of the question stem I, in, in my answer. One trend in the data about cases by age group is that 20 to 29-year-old, after the 20 to 29-year-old bracket, older age groups have fewer and fewer cases. I forgot the S there. but So fewer and fewer cases. So we see younger people have more, more um, younger people in their 20s anyway, and then it drops off from there. Another potential answer is this. The groups with the lowest case levels are the youngest, 0 to 19-year-olds, and the oldest, over 70. Um, those are the fewest levels of cases. Um, so you could say that. So notice that when you're doing a trend, different people could have different trends. All right? Okay, let's look at another question. Draw a conclusion. This is a really common thing. So you got to identify a trend and then you have to draw a conclusion about that trend. So be careful of the trend you grab. You might want to change your answer and your trend um, because in one, it might be easier to draw a conclusion from different trends. So draw a conclusion about this trend described in Part B. By the way, this conclusion doesn't necessarily have to be true, but it does need to be accurate according to the data. So let me give an example. Here's two examples, actually. Younger people, 20 to 29 year olds, are more likely to get COVID because they're out in groups more. So that could be one conclusion about that trend, right? I mean, 20 to 20 year olds are active socially, so they get COVID. Older people over 30 are more isolated. You know, they live at home, they have children. So they're more likely to avoid groups, so less likely to get COVID. So either of those would be valid conclusions based on the data. Based on this data, if the government was trying to slow the spread of the pandemic with public service announcements, what might be its approach to messaging? So now we get like a policy question. Policy just means a rule or a law or something that the government's going to do, an action the government's going to take to a problem. So um, what might the government do now that they look at this data? Well, here's a possible thing. It would target likely target its messaging toward working age people between ages of 20 and 60 because they are most likely to get COVID. So they might have some, you know, recommend some some strategies for those that for that group. All right. Awesome. Now that's one set of data. Sometimes you get two sets of data and you have to compare and contrast them. Now I'm going to show you a second piece of data here. And I want you to pause after each question to try to come up with it on your own. And then I'll tell you what the answer is. All right. Now we're looking at a different set of data. 
and this is deaths by age group in Virginia. Notice how the data changed dramatically. Let me just go back here. So there's just cases if you tested positive for COVID. Now, did you die from COVID? Very different set of data. Um, very, very different. And so you might draw different conclusions about COVID. Here, you might draw one conclusion about COVID. Young people, 20 to 20 year old, 30s year olds. But then all of a sudden here, you draw a totally different conclusion about COVID. So let's look at that. I want you to pause after. I read the question and see if you can answer the first one. So identify an age group with the lowest risk from COVID-19. Pause, answer it. Okay, the answer is an age group with the lowest risk of COVID would be 10 to 19 year olds because they have zero deaths. All right, so 10, 10 to 19 year olds. You could also say zero to nine year olds. Two answers would have worked there. But the point is that you're using complete sentences and you're also using part of the um, question in order to answer it. Describe the difference in deaths by age groups between teenagers and, and elderly 80 plus. So describe the differences in deaths. So you go ahead and do that. You might even want to write it out so that way you get a feel for complete sentences and see how it compares to mine. Pause. All right. So what did I put as an answer? Teenagers have zero deaths so far, but 80 plus have had more deaths with over 1,276 deaths. Uh, have the most deaths with over 1,276. So very clearly, COVID is something that impacts elderly and has very, very, very little impact on people that are young. That would be something you could you could use. Okay, good. C, explain how the information on the graph could be used to protect certain groups. Take a, take a second and answer that. All right, here's what I put. Um, clearly, those over 60 years old are at most risk, especially those over 80. So those people should be protected and told to stay home as much as possible. You might even mention like nursing homes because people over 80 are more likely to be in a nursing home. So you might talk about like precautions that maybe a nursing home might take or there need to be precautions. You don't have to be very specific about it. Just say precautions for elderly people in nursing homes. So um, that's something to be very clear. So again, it's kind of a policy thing. You draw on a conclusion. It might not be totally right, but it's it's reasonable given the data. And then lastly, how might the data impact school age children? Pause. Um, and I probably could be, have a little bit better question there. I could even ask like policies for school age children or something. But what I put is a more generic answer, which is that people under 20 have, ver have zero deaths. So the risk from COVID is very low for them. Restrictions on students would be far lower than those on older people unless they live with someone at risk. So that would be a potential answer. There's several different things you could write there. But the bottom, bottom line is clearly um, if you're young, COVID isn't um, you know very serious for you, but it is if you're very old. In fact, uh, research has shown um, that the, uh, based on CDC da data that we might look at in, in the future weeks, um, you're far more likely to die from the flu if you're under 25 than if you are, um, than from COVID actually. All right, great. All right, so here's a real example from the class. So I'm going to read each one and then you're going to have to answer um, the question. So I'll pause and you're actually going to type in an answer for me. All right. Identify the year with, the, so first look at the data. So we have U.S. House re-election rates. So it's the chance that someone who's in office actually wins re-election 1964 to 2008. That's the top chat data. And then you have a bottom data, U.S. Senate re-election rates, 1964 to 2008. So you might just take it, uh, take a um, moment and kind of look at that. And let me move this over here so you can see a little better. All right, great. So um, here we go. Identify the year with the lowest re-election rate in the Senate. Okay. Two, you should have already typed in your answer. Number two, compare and contrast re-election rates between the U.S. House and the U.S. Senate. Remember, compare and contrast. Draw a conclusion, number three about why some years re-election rates are far lower than other years. So you're drawing a conclusion. Why do you think, what, what might make people in Congress lose elections more likely? What might that make that make that more likely? So you draw a conclusion about why that is. And then lastly, number four, describe how these charts represent the idea of popular sovereignty. So you need to know what popular sovereignty means and then apply it to these, this chart. So that's an, um, an application of a vocabulary. All right, cool. So 
you should have answered these questions. And uh, when you're done, just submit it. And then that's done with the assignment. Thanks.